My goal this evening is to share with you what the church teaches about the reality of evil, the practice of exorcism, and then to share with you some of my experiences over these past nine years in this ministry. I'll give a presentation. If you have questions, you're welcome to ask questions. We'll save some time at the end, but I guess if there's a burning question about something that I say at that moment, you can raise your hand. So the goal will be to give a presentation, to be informal, and then hopefully when you leave here this evening, we'll have a better understanding of this topic. Now the place to begin any discussion on exorcism is to define what is meant by the term because many people have an idea of what they believe the word to be all about based on their own study or their research or by watching such movies as The Exorcist, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, The Right, and now there's a couple of new movies coming out, isn't there? Ouija Board and Annabelle. Annabelle. So it's Halloween, so a lot of movies are coming out. The word itself comes from the Greek word exorcismos and is a term that signifies an insistent request manifested towards God or directed against demons. Literally, it means to bind with an oath, and there are two different kinds of exorcisms within the church. There's a supplicating exorcism, and then there's also an imperative exorcism. A supplicating exorcism is a prayer directed to God, who is asked to expel the demon, and an imperative exorcism is a command to the demon, demanding it to, part, to depart based on the power and the authority of God. One does not need to be a priest to perform a supplicating exorcism, because since it's a prayer directed to God, we know that anyone can pray. So anyone can pray for a friend or perhaps a family member, asking God to help bring them the deliverance that they're seeking. However, an imperative exorcism as an official liturgical rite of the Catholic Church is reserved to the priest who has been designated to perform this ministry uh, by his bishop. So the Catholic Church recognizes that exorcism exists in different faith traditions, so we don't have a monopoly on that, but since it is a liturgical rite of our church, then it is reserved to the one appointed by his bishop. I was appointed to be the exorcist for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis back in 2005, so I, would, I didn't volunteer for the job. <laughs> when you are ordained a priest, you promise obedience to your bishop. And in 2005, the priest who had been doing this ministry in Indianapolis passed away. And then the bishop was looking for a replacement, and he pointed to me. So after my appointment in fall of 2005, while on sabbatical in Rome for three months, I received training from a Franciscan priest who now has been doing this ministry for more than 34 years. Over the time I was in Rome, I was able to participate in 40 different exorcisms and to learn firsthand the church's ministry to those who were up against the forces of evil and who were seeking the help of the church. In April of 2012, I had the opportunity to return to Rome and attend the Vatican course on exorcism, and this past year, I became a member of the International Association of Exorcists. So there is an international body. The group gets together every two years where exorcists can come together and kind of share stories and learn from one another. That meeting is currently taking place in Rome right now this week, but I chose to be at Texas State University. <laughs> Why go to Rome when you can come to San Marcos, right? <laughs> he knows, he knows. It's, it's, it's the same thing, she said. There you go. So demonic activity can be classified under two main categories. It can either be ordinary or extraordinary. Ordinary activity of the devil would have to deal with temptation, something that we all struggle with on a daily basis. Extraordinary demonic activity comes under four different categories. The first one would be demonic infestation, which would have to do with the presence of evil in a location or associate it with an object. Next would be demonic vexation or harassment. These are physical attacks that a person undergo undergoes from a evil spirit. There's also demonic obsession. These are mental attacks where an evil spirit will play on a person's mind, perhaps on their senses, when people start thinking they, they're seeing shadowy figures or perhaps noises in the room and whatnot, 
that would be an example of demonic obsession. And then finally, demonic possession itself, whereby the devil or some other evil spirit will take temporary control of a person's body, treating that body as if it were its own. Demonic possession always seems to get the most interest and attention by people, so it will be the example that I talk about the most this evening. Now, the tradition of the church has maintained four criteria in evaluating the validity of cases of demonic possession. These include the ability to speak and understand languages otherwise unknown to the individual, elevated perception, knowledge about things that a person shouldn't otherwise know. There can be strong resistance to anything of a divine nature, such as the Bible being in a sacred place, a crucifix, holy water, a relic, and so on. And then finally, exhibiting extraordinary human strength beyond the normal capacity of the person. It's also possible to know that the presence of evil is around when symptoms of the demonic are observed. These include bodily contortions. They also include a change in a person's voice, a change in physical appearance, unpleasant odors, and a change in their temperature in the room. Now, all of these can be indications of demonic possession, but before proceeding with the rite of exorcism, the medical and mental health of the individual must also be considered. The exorcist, in many ways, is trained to be a skeptic, so if everyone believes that a person is possessed, I should be the last one to believe that. So I must exhaust every other, perhaps, possibility of why the person is acting the way they are before I would reach the moral certitude before proceeding with the actual ritual itself. Persons who are disturbed must never be hastily examined or casually judged. Exor exorcisms will help those who are dealing with spiritual problems, but they will not help those who suffer from mental health issues. Therefore, experts in the medical and psychiatric sciences are always consulted. Now, people are oftentimes surprised to know that as a priest, that I utilize experts in the mental health field. Most people presume that the priest always sees the devil and runs out of his room with the rite of exorcism in order to pray over the person, whereby perhaps the mental health expert grabs the DSM-4 and then runs out the door. And the <laughs> now, the truth is that science and religion need not be at odds with one another because the overriding goal should be to bring relief in the life of one who is suffering, whether that be due to psychic or spiritual causes. Now, the greatest debate surrounding the practice of exorcism is that there can be medical explanations for the demonic symptoms that the church considers to be signs of demonic possession. Several psychological disorders, including Tourette syndrome and schizophrenia, can produce the same types of effects in people who are considered to be possessed. Those with epilepsy can suddenly go into a convulsion when they're having a seizure. Tourette syndrome causes involuntary movements and vocal outbursts. Schizophrenia involves auditory and visual hallucinations, paranoia, delusions, and sometimes violent behavior. Psychological issues like low self-esteem and narcissism can also cause a person to act out the role of one who is possessed in order to gain attention. It's my opinion that in a case where a person is in fact suffering from mental health problems, the church will be doing great harm by labeling that person possessed if it keeps them from getting the true help that they need. So once again, the church wants to give people the help they need, not the help that they think that they need. So medical experts, psychological experts, and then those who do the ministry of exorcism would come together and then they would decide what is the best course of action. Now any discussion on exorcism also needs to include the topic of faith because the two go hand in hand. In fact, exorcism should always be seen within the wider scope of overall pastoral care. That is why that in the war against evil, we can say that we have two weapons. One is offensive and the other is defensive. The offensive weapon is the ritual of exorcism and the defensive weapon that we can use is a dynamic relationship 
with God. What all of us need to realize is that when faith is strong in us and in the world in which we live, evil is kept at bay. It is when faith becomes weak and less relevant in the world that evil seems to have the upper hand. Faith in God will lead us in one direction, and the lack of faith will lead us in another. The Western world in which we live has been profoundly shaped by Christianity. That's true of our language, our thought, and our beliefs. And yet today there is a rejection of Christianity on many levels. Current stats even suggest that the age group of 18 to 29 now professes to have no religious affiliation whatsoever. So even though many of these young people were raised in a Christian environment, they choose no longer to believe in God, to practice any faith, and perhaps they even <coughs> profess themselves to be atheists. Archbishop Charles Chaput of Philadelphia puts it this way, it seems that God has become less welcome at the center of human life. It's even true that many people who claim to be Christian simply do not know the person of Jesus Christ. They're just going through the motions of their faith. They may be wearing that label, but at the same time, their faith has been completely lost. All of us need to realize that where hearts are on fire for Jesus Christ, there is no need to talk of the devil or to be afraid of him. When faith becomes lukewarm or downright rejected, then that's another matter. It's my opinion that the reason that God has become less relevant in people's lives is that we have a distorted view of what it means to be free. <clears throat> Many people today believe that if you have a relationship with God, that that relationship is stifling on your freedom. And yet St. John Paul II often spoke that freedom, in the true sense of the word, means to live according to God's plan for us. So when we are faithful to God and to his commandments that he has given to us, then we are truly free. Too many people today believe that freedom means that we can do whatever we want. The end result is that we create a truth that has no basis in scripture and we end up becoming slaves to our own passions and desires. So at a time when people are losing touch with their Christian heritage, there's a great risk for falling for ideas that sound appealing but are actually misleading and can be extremely dangerous. St. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, says, Satan transforms himself into an angel of light, and he deceives many people. So why are the devil and demons getting so much attention today? Because as people are turning away from God, they are developing a fascination with spiritism, Satanism, and magic practices. Stimulated by television shows, movies, various kinds of literature, and the internet, Every kind of occultism is on the rise in the Western world. People today, especially young people, are intrigued by such things as divinations, fortune-telling, witchcraft, magic, curses, spells, Ouija boards, paranormal activity, ghosts, haunted houses, medians, psychics, and so on. The truth is that when people get caught up in these things, they may not have a full grasp of what they're getting themselves into. They may think that it's all just fun and entertainment, but in reality, they are opening themselves up to the presence of evil. Now, there are those who laugh at the topic of evil and who believe that exorcism and demon possession come out of a primitive, superstitious worldview. Perhaps a throwback to the time of Christ or to the Middle Ages, to a time when mental health issues were not well understood. For some people today, even to talk about exorcism or the devil is an embarrassment. No doubt there are those who do not believe in the existence of things that cannot be seen, measured, or proven through human reason. Yet a major theme throughout the New Testament is the clash between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. St. Paul, in writing to the Ephesians, says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We can say that Jesus' entire mission is directed towards freeing us from demonic influence. We read in the first letter of John, the reason the Son of, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. In the Acts of the Apostles, we are told 
God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. So where did the devil and all the other evil spirits come from? So if they exist, what is their origin? The word devil means adversary, slanderer, opposer. The word Satan means accuser. Sometime between the dawn of creation and the intrusion of Satan into the Garden of Eden, Lucifer, the greatest of all the angelic creatures, along with all of one-third of all the angels that God created, fell from grace, he became the devil, and the other fallen angels became the evil spirits. This story is recounted in the book of Revelation in chapter 12, where it says, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and he prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. St. Thomas Aquinas, when he was reflecting on when were the angels created, he said, and if you go to the book of Genesis, when God said, let there be light, he identifies that as the moment when the angelic world was created. Because when God created the light, what's the next, next thing God did? He separated the light into day and into darkness. When God created light, he said it was good, but when he separated the light, there was not a reference to good. And St. Thomas Aquinas believed that's where the judgment of the angels took place. These creatures were created by God. They had free will. They could choose God's plan or they could reject it. Those who accepted God's plan were, uh, became perfected and entered into the heavenly realm, and then the others were cast out. Scripture sometimes refers to angels as stars, which is why prior to his rebellion, Lucifer was called the star of the morning. And to this description, John in the book of Revelation adds, his tail swept one-third of the stars out of the sky. So his decision to sin against God influenced one-third of all the angelic creatures to disobey against God as well, and they were cast down upon the earth. So what went wrong? Lucifer, like all angels, was created for the purpose of glorifying God. However, instead of serving God and praising him forever, he desired to rule over heaven and creation in the place of God. He wanted supreme authority. In chapter 14 of the book of the prophet Isaiah, Lucifer said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. I will ascend the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And the key word in all these phrases is I which is why we say that his sin was the sin of pride. People often ask me if it's possible for the devil and the other rebellious angels to one day repent. So could they ever say, hey, we're sorry, and could they be forgiven? And the answer is no. So their judgment has taken place for all eternity. Angels are purely intellectual beings that received infused knowledge from the moment that they were created. So all of you are here at Texas State so that you can learn and grow in knowledge. But each angel received infused knowledge. Basically, God downloaded all this knowledge into them, <laughs> like a computer, you could say. And because angels, these angels knew the possible consequences of their rejection against God, namely to be cast into hell, they remained obstinate in their will. So the angels cannot be forgiven purely from the fact that they would never ask for forgiveness. But because they knew what could happen to them and they chose it anyway, they remained obstinate. So these fallen angels uh, know that we as humans are still capable of that which they rejected to be with God forever. Therefore they try to trip us up so that we will make the same poor choice that they themselves have made. So what defense do we have against them? The Bible presents us with very specific instructions on how we can gain victory over the devil. We are told in Ephesians, do not give the devil a foothold. St. Peter teaches us in 1 Peter, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about 
seeking him whom he may devour. And in the book of James we are told, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now this belief in the reality of evil doesn't need, mean that we need to be afraid. The demonic plays upon fear, it represses humanity and courage, and it presents lies as the truth. Go back to the Garden of Eden again. When Adam and Eve were tempted, what did, how did the devil respond? He said, surely you will not die, you will become like gods. So he gave them a false truth as a way to get them to give in to the sin of temptation. Now, according to church teaching, the devil cannot act directly on a person's intellect or a person's will because these are spiritual faculties. There can be no actual union between an evil spirit and a human soul. The soul always remains free, no matter what antics the devil may put the body through. But the devil, or any evil spirit, can act on a person's memory and the imagination, which are corporeal faculties. It also needs to be clearly stated that unclean spirits cannot read our thoughts and our minds. They do not know what we are thinking. They do not know the future. However, with their intuitive knowledge of human nature, they can deduce what we might be thinking or how we might act by watching us closely and noting the effects that their temptations are having upon us. They can influence our thoughts by way of the imagination, and they can excite feelings in us such as lust, anger, or despair. Evil spirits vary in strength, boldness, and malice. So, how many angels are there? Does anyone know? How many angels are there? <laughs> The book of Revelation says myriads and myriads, thousands and thousands. So what's one third of that number? So there are many, many, many evil spirits. Math was never my forte, but one third of a lot is still a lot. St. Thomas Aquinas used to talk about the nine choirs of angels, the highest being the seraphim, and then the cherubim and the thrones and so on, the lowest being angels themselves. So when one third of the angels fell, they fell from all of the nine choirs. So the demons actually vary in strength. So even though they fell, they still retain their knowledge that God had infused in them. So they do have a superior intellect. That's why one who is possessed can speak a language that the person perhaps did not know because the demon wouldn't have to go and learn a language. It would just know it. They could just call upon it from the knowledge that it received. So they do vary in strength, boldness, and malice. They have their specialties. And in order to implant a particular vice, they look for the opportune time when we are at our weakest for us to let our spiritual guard down. Their power over us will increase or decrease based on the resistance that they meet in us. Resistance that can be built up when we continually strive to grow in holiness according to God's plan for us. So, for example, if you're a Catholic, if you go to Mass, if you're praying and receiving the sacraments, if you're from another Christian faith tradition, if you're going to services and you're praying, the devil is already on the run because you're doing the very things that it has rejected. So, if you're strong in your faith, you have nothing to worry about goes back to what I said earlier about when faith becomes let lukewarm, then perhaps we can open ourselves up to the presence of evil. You know, even though as a Catholic priest, I'm an exorcist, half of the people who come to me are not Catholic. They come from other Christian faith traditions or from even other non-Christian faith traditions looking for help against the evil that they believe they're up against. I'm so sorry. Can I just really quick question so yes. I don't forget at the end? Um, so... When you're saying, like, even when you become, like, just kind of, like, passive in religion, like, not all, like, like, the devil and demons are more susceptible, like, are more There's a difference between being passive in religion, where you still believe, but maybe you're not going to get the Catholic okay. of the oh, Year award or anything oh. like that. Would you say that that group of people might be more susceptible to, like, demonic activity? It can be, because to use your example of a Ouija board, 
somebody uses it once, no big deal. But it's when perhaps when people start getting, they go, they play with it once. So maybe even the other example would be like going to see a, a psychic or a medium. So you go out of curiosity, and then you're like, you become intrigued. So you go back, and all of a sudden you've kind of built up the practice of going because you're intrigued by all that. So. I mean, I guess, have you seen a pattern of the people that you've done exorcisms on that? That's the life of, yeah. Have you seen a consistent A slippery pattern. slope, yes. Okay. A life of habitual sin. I'll talk about those in a moment. What are the ways that we can open up ourselves to evil? But that would be one of the ways. Now, the good news is demonic possession is not contagious. <laughs> so I, it's not like Ebola or <laughs> the swine flu or the bird flu. Or, but we don't have to use hand sanitizer to, to keep it away. <laughs> So, evil can come about in our lives either directly or indirectly when someone opens up a doorway to evil. So how is this doorway open? And I identify six main ways. You know, it's important to know that evil spirits, as pure spirits, have no body and form. So we can't really say that they're here or they're there. We say that they're here or there if they're choosing to act either on a person or in a place. So why are they choosing to act? And the reason seems to be that perhaps someone has opened up a doorway to evil in their lives. The number one way that people can do these things, six ways, not in any particular order, but the first way that I would mention are ties to the occult. So the word occult comes from the Latin word occultus, meaning hidden or secret. It focuses on knowledge of the paranormal, it's associated with such things as palm reading, medians, Ouija boards, tarot cards, psychics, witchcraft, and anything else that speaks of sacrilege and blasphemy. All of these things are condemned because they're a violation of the first commandment that God has given us. What is the first commandment? You shall have no false gods. So when one chooses to utilize these occult practices, what they're basically saying is, God is deficient, God is not enough, so I have to turn to other sources to try to find what I need in my life. All of these practices are condemned uh, right there in the book of De Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, where it says, you must never practice black magic, be a fortune teller or witch, cast spells, ask ghosts or spirits for help, or consult the dead. In chapter 19 of the book of Leviticus, we are told, do not defile yourselves by turning to medians or to those who consult the spirits of the dead. I am the Lord your God. The church would tell you that the power that psychics or medians claim to have to see the future or whatnot, no one knows the future except God alone. Because God exists outside of time and space as we know it. God created that. So no one knows what we call the future except for God himself. If one claims to know that, they've either been duped by evil into thinking that they do know these things, or they're uh, compliant with the evil spirits, if you will, allowing them to work through them. But the church would say no one can have these powers because it's outside of human nature. It's not a part of who we are as creatures of God. Another way, second way that we can open up ourselves to evil is through a curse, which would be the opposite of a blessing. So if something is cursed, we say that it's, it's damned, it's uh, commended to, to the devil or to some evil spirit. If something is blessed, it's commended to God. So I believe that a curse is only effective if we are weak in our relationship with God. Because we cannot control what another person does. Another person may wish us ill will, and they may call upon evil forces to cause us harm. But if we're standing strong in our faith, then we need not fear whatsoever. Uh, I receive about 12 phone calls or emails every week from throughout the United States. I had a call one time from uh, northern Indiana where a couple told me that they had an employee in their business who they terminated for being a bad employee. And then she was a professed witch, 
and then she said that she had placed a curse upon them. And uh, these people were not strong in their faith. They were not really practicing their faith anymore. And so it really got under their skin. When I went up to visit with them, uh, this woman had actually sacrificed animals on their property. There were burnt animal parts by the front door of the building and at the back door of the building where she had done some type of ritual practice to uh, cast a spell upon them, if you will. Now, I prayed with them, and you know, I told them, I said, what you need to do is get back into a right relationship with Christ, because I can come and pray. If she curses again, do you want me to come back and pray? She curses, I keep coming back. When does it all end? It ends when the people finally realize that what this woman is doing means absolutely nothing to someone who has a committed relationship with Jesus Christ. So the role of an exorcist really is to be an evangelist, to help bring people into a deeper relationship with Christ and uh, to make that relationship very meaningful. What about holy people that get attacked? Holy people who get attacked? That would be an example of... So we had infestation, vexation, or harassment, obsession, possession. There are also something called oppression, and that's what you're talking about. We can say that demonic oppression is a gift from God. Doesn't that sound strange? <laughs> <laughs> that God would allow someone to be tormented by evil as a way to show their fidelity to God and as a way to grow in holiness. So there's the example of Job out of the Old Testament. There's the example of St. Paul himself, who says there in 2 Corinthians that he suffered a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan sent to torment him to keep him from becoming proud. Within our Catholic faith, we have the example of St. Padre Pio, who struggled with evil in his life. So it does seem that God allows people to experience this presence of evil as a way to show their fidelity to him. If you know the story of Job out of the Old Testament, Job has lost everything. He's put on sackcloth. He's sitting in ashes. His friends say to him, curse God and die. And how does Job respond? He beats his chest and he says, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In other words, if things in my life be good, I glorify God. If they be bad, I glorify God. My personal circumstances mean absolutely nothing when it comes to my relationship with God. So that would be oppression. Could you fall into that slippery slope and then get attacked by demons and then profess oppression? You could, because in, so if Job had decided to curse God and die, then he would have rejected God, and then the, the devil's temptation against him would have won. So that would be possible. I meant that in a different way. Like, you bring demons on yourself and then Yeah, because if you bring demons on your own, there's no way that you can control them yourself. So you have to ask them. Yes. Even as an exorcist, I don't have any special powers or abilities. I don't have a big E on my chest. <laughs> <laughs> the power rests with Jesus Christ. So the exorcist acts in the person and is based on the authority of Christ to bring relief in the life of the one who is suffering. The exorcist that I trained with in Rome even reminded me when I left, he goes, when you're doing this ministry, if you ever think to yourself, wow, look at what I'm doing, he said, you've just walked on unholy ground because we're back to what the devil said, I, 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 I. So the focus should always be on the power of God. So a curse, the third way that we can open up a doorway to evil is by being dedicated to a demon. Anyone under the age of reason, and does anybody know what the age of reason is? It is seven, which is why within the Catholic Church that the age when children make their first reconciliation and first communion. Because by the time you reach the age of seven, you have a good grasp of right and wrong. So anyone under the age of reason cannot bring on evil upon themselves. They cannot do that. God will protect and safeguard them. However, one under the age of reason could be influenced 
by someone else. An example of this, when I was in Rome, I encountered a, uh, a young lady who was coming to Carmen, Father Carmine, who told me that when she was born, her mother had dedicated her to Satan. She said when her mother was pregnant with her, her mother didn't want her, attempted to abort her, the abortion was not successful, she was born, and her mother was angry at God for giving her a child that she did not want, so her mother decided that she would get even with God by dedicating her daughter to Satan and then raising her up in satanic ritual practices. When she was 13, she ran away from home. She ended up on the streets of Rome. She eventually made her way to Father Carmine, who began to pray the uh, ritual of exorcism with her. The good news about this woman is that uh, she was completely free of all this demonic presence in her life. She even went on to dedicate her life to God. She entered into religious life, and she's a nun today that ministers to street children in Rome. So, there's an There's an example of just because somebody is possessed doesn't mean that they're lost forever. Something in that person is always free, and that part that's free can always ask for help. Fourth way that we can open up a doorway to evil is by a life of habitual sin. So if somebody sins over and over again, and eventually they lose the ability to distinguish right from wrong. Basically, truth becomes relative. So if they think it's right, it's right. If they think it's wrong, it's wrong. There's even a series of questions that can be asked that come out of the, the Vatican, from the Vatican course on exorcism. Some of these questions would be, so if someone's coming to me and trying to determine perhaps that if it's the life of habitual sin, so please describe the experiences which lead you to believe that you are being affected by the presence of evil. Uh, please describe your psychological history. Do you have any history with chemical addiction or alcohol or drug abuse? Have any history with the use of pornography? Um, have you any experience of history engaging in the occult or witchcraft? Have you had any relationships or contact with people who are associated with the occult or satanic, satanic practices? Have you ever attended a satanic black mass or other satanic ritual? One of these was performed recently up in Oklahoma City. They were at the Civic Center. Uh, have you ever tried to communicate with spirits, demons, or the devil himself? Has anyone ever tried to place a curse upon you? Do you have any aversion to sacred objects or rituals? So some of these questions could give the exorcist the moral certitude that he might need to believe that perhaps a life of habitual sin uh, invited the evil in. Another way is by actually inviting a demon into your life. So an act of the free will, you say to the evil spirit, I invite you to come into me. So you willingly allow yourself to be possessed. I don't know if anybody has, there's an episode of Paranormal Witness. If you've never seen it, it's an episode, uh, I did an interview with a British film com company, and they actually did an episode on Paranormal Witness and recreated an exorcism that I performed in southern Indiana. So uh, my sister watched it and she, she told me that she couldn't sleep for a week. <laughs> she told me I was nuts. <laughs> I think if, if you do paranormal witness and that... Yes, so. Did someone levitate in that one? Yes. <laughs> yes, so... Now, the exorcisms are not videotaped, so they recreated. My sister told me that the exorcism was going on, and when the demon manifested itself, the woman who was possessed ran out of the room. My sister told me that she would have said to that woman, Sayonara, and walked out and ran out there. <laughs> so why don't they film this? Just to make sure there's not vain curiosity, which is why they're not filmed. So it's just a prayer of the church. So, but this woman had told me that she believed that she had a friend who was possessed. And so she went up to her friend one time and looked her right in the eye and said to her friend, whatever in you I invite to come in to me, come now. And she said the words no sooner got out of her mouth that she felt something come over her. And for the next 13 years, she 
experienced demonic manifestations in her life. Um, her husband even witnessed many of these things. He said sometimes at night she would just, right in the middle of the night, she would lift straight up in bed. She would start foaming at the mouth and growling at him, and her eyes would roll back in her head. And, nope, um, nope. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say, honey, I think I'll on the couch. <laughs> Forward back to my sister again, where he could have said sayonara. <laughs> so working with this woman, there were seven demons that identified themselves in her. The ritual of exorcism, the exorcist can command the demons to name themselves because when they name themselves, they're showing that they're submitting to the power and the authority of God. So the uh, weaker demons are always the first to go. Remember, demons fell out of the, all the nine choirs. So the weaker ones are the first to go because they don't want to be tortured and tormented by God. The more dominant demon in this case uh, told me that it was going to refuse to leave because it had been invited in. This demon named itself as Leviathan, oh, no, the demon oh, mentioned in... Sorry? She's creeping out up here just a little bit. <laughs> I don't know the name, honestly. I was going to ask if they all, like, all seven names. When, when, this, when these demons named themselves, there were seven distinct voices that came out of this person's mouth at the same time. I can't even describe what that was like hearing that, but there were seven distinct voices as each one named itself, showing that it was submitting to the power and the authority of God. And then... The, the, well, once again, the weaker ones were the first to go, and then Leviathan was the one who continued to mock me as I prayed. Would you at one point, and this is if you saw the movie, it's like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so uh, I worked with this uh, woman for over the course of a year. I had other priests who came and assisted me, and I would see her about every six weeks. Exorcisms are always performed in a sacred space. So unlike Hollywood, they're not in an abandoned house on the dead end. They forgot to pay the light bill. <laughs> so they're always held in a, a church or a chapel. Uh, I will determine where they're going to be, when they're going to be, who's going to be present. Uh, so I will dictate all the terms of that. So when this, when, in working with this particular woman, the other six demons were gone, so there was uh, Leviathan. We, I was at a parish in southern Indiana, an old convent chapel. Outside the convent chapel, there was a grade school that had 400 children in it. It was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and a bell rang, and 400 children are now pouring outside on the parking lot. The demon began screaming and laughing hysterically and tells me, People are going to hear these screams, and then they're going to come and see what's going on, and you're going to have to stop. So why don't you just stop now? Stop what you're doing and leave me alone. And then started screaming again and laughing hysterically. And then I commanded, using the rite of exorcism, for the demon to be silent and to obey me in all things and to submit to the power of Christ. I commanded it to say the words, Hail Mary, full of grace, to show... <laughs> Authority of, of God, the demon looked at me and laughed and goes, Grace of fool. And then I commanded it to say the words in the order that it was told to say them and then to immediately depart. And then this demon that had been speaking in this very demasculine voice looked at me and, like a baby, goes, Hail Mary, full of grace. And then there was a scream, and the woman in front of me changed instantly. All the manifestations of evil were gone. So the change in her complexion and face changed quicker than you could snap your fingers. All the presence of evil was gone. Wait, was the voice of a child mocking, or was it like it reverting back to a childlike innocence and submitting to God? It was reverting to like a scared little okay. child. Because <laughs> up against the magnitude yeah. and the glory of God, yeah. it just had to shrink. Oh. It just cowered down. That is so cool. <laughs> I, I shared that story with others before, and then people ask me, well, what did you do afterwards? You, did you, like, you know, go and pray for an hour or whatever? And I 
I told him no because I was two hours from my parish, so I stopped at Dairy Queen on the way experience brokenness within our families and in our homes, and that happens a lot. But when people do not deal with brokenness in a healthy manner, then that can invite evil in. Oftentimes when there's brokenness within families, people give in to bitterness, resentment, anger, and hatred, and these are the very things that evil will feed upon, because we know that Christ came to create community, he gave us the church, but the, de the devil would be all about division, so broken relationships. A great example of that is uh, found in chapter 5 of Mark's Gospel, <coughs> the story of the Gerasene demoniac, probably the story you might be familiar with. Jesus is passing through Samaritan territory. <coughs> He's passing by these tombs, and a man who's possessed by legion comes out, and they begin saying to Jesus, what have you to do with us? Have you come to torment us before the proper time? Because Jesus had been commanding them to come out. We know who you are, the Holy One of God. So the demons asked to be cast into the swine. You know the story? They go into the swine, they race down the hillside, they are drowned. And then the very most significant thing happens. The man who was possessed, who was living amongst the dead, because he was living in the tombs, now wants to follow Jesus down the road. But Jesus says to him, Go home to your family. Jesus wants to restore him to a rightful place within his family. And the belief amongst exorcists is that it was an unhealthy, broken family relationship that brought about demonic possession in this man's life. Yeah, actually, I have a couple questions about that. Um, uh -huh. So Luke 8, uh, verse 30, talks about, um, you know, Jesus asking about the and he says, um, for many demons have entered into my first question is, can there be multiple uh, possessions? Yes. Okay, and then also in Matthew um, chapter 8, um, it says that there were two uh, two men, so two demon acts, two men that were possessed, um, whereas Luke and Mark talk about one man that was possessed with. Um, Mark doesn't say many demons, Mark just says legion, or we were many. Um, Luke says um, many demons, mm -hmm. and then Matthew talks about two men. What's uh, gospel of the church, like what gospel does the church actually, I guess, because they, they differ, uh, the church would accept them all. I mean, okay. it's like even the, sometimes books of the Bible can they present the truth about the reality of evil, but somehow sometimes the way the stories are explained, they can be a little different. It's like in the book of in the in the book of Genesis, there are two accounts of creation. One, God created Adam and then created the animals. And none was a suitable partner. Another one, God created the animals and then humans. So they both can't be right. But Catholics, we wouldn't get caught up in all that. We would just say, we know that we're created by God, and that's the most important thing. And I have one last question. Um, because there could be multiple possessions, um, he sent them out to 2,000 swine. So that means that maybe Legion uh, is more than 2,000. It wouldn't be a cap of 2,000 mm -hmm. being one possession per swine. Yeah. Be more, yeah. Be it, it does seem that uh, evil spirits can be clustered together. Oftentimes, perhaps, there's a more dominant demon that's controlling the others. It's not a sense of fraternity, if you will. So they're not really, because a more dominant one could torture the lower ones. So then that means that like, um, demons can possess animals too, then? Yes. The notion is that demons can exist in the created world, either in human, animal, plant, or water. Can you repeat that? Human, animal, plant, or water. <laughs> Presence of, of evil around water. What's essential for human life? Water. So where would perhaps evil be around to try to get to humans? <laughs> That's one of the reasons why, I always say this, it creeps people out a bit, but why do we bless our food before we eat? 
It isn't just because. Can you help me? It isn't just because we're thanking God. We should. But these prayers were always a form of a minor exorcism, if you will, asking God to bless them before we consume it. So. Our own manifestation of paranoia and actually an evil spirit. Yeah. Well, I think it goes back to uh, living out your faith. For me, as an exorcist, my goal is not to be fixated on the reality of evil, but to help people get fixated on God. I would say, I don't want to see the devil everywhere. I want to help people see the face of God in their lives. So it's a matter of shifting people's focus. Because people become kind of obsessed, if you will, by. You know, things you go bump in the night. <laughs> I, I, I don't lose sleep over any of this stuff. And I'm not afraid to go walking out at night or anything like that because that's where the evil would, would play on your imagination and whatnot. So it's always important just to just remember that evil is still a, a, a creature. We should never think that God and the devil are on the same playing field. You know, it's not like God is the good God and the devil is the bad God. That's erroneous. The devil would always want to propose that he is more than that which he is, but he'll try to use his intellect to make us seem that he's more than he really is. You know, St. Thomas Aquinas would tell you that your guardian angel is more powerful than the devil himself. Yeah. Now, why would that be? Because he uses the terms, it's kind of technical, but I'll throw it out there. He uses it morning and evening knowledge. So when God created the angelic world, they received evening knowledge, knowledge of the natural order. When they were created, then they had the chance to be glorified by accepting the morning knowledge, to be glorified by accepting God's truth. Those who did became perfect creatures. The devil and the demons that rejected the truth of God remained imperfect. Go back to the story of, of Genesis, the story of creation. Every time God created, it was evening came and morning followed, and then it was a new day. So only when morning arrived was a new day there. So angels that received evening and morning knowledge are perfect creatures. The demons who only received evening knowledge that did not accept the morning knowledge are imperfect creatures. And a perfect creature is more powerful than an imperfect creature, even if its intellect is superior. Because one has glory and one lacks it. So you think for a moment, how does that pertain to us as humans? On the sixth day of creation, God created humans and he created animals. What separates humans from animals? God gave us the seventh day. The day that we can choose to honor and glorify him. So when we choose to honor and glorify God, you could say we're perfect creatures. Because we're exactly what God intended us to be. But when we don't glorify God, when we don't live for the seventh day, if you will, we're kind of trapped on the sixth day. And it's interesting that when, when demons manifest, a lot of times they're animalistic in nature. See, there's that notion of rejection of God. And when most people think about, you know, in the book of Revelation, the mark of the beast, what number is it? 666. Is it really a perfect number or an imperfect number? Because it's, they're, they're stuck on imperfection. They're lacking God. So, let me quickly, I'm going to share with you briefly the rite of exorcism, and then I think if there's any other questions. So what does the rite look like? So demons have power. They can only be defeated by power. Exorcism is an encounter with a power greater than a demon, and God is that power, and exorcism is the way that we call God for. So when I decide to do an exorcism, so my bishop has given me... Um, free reign, if you will. If I believe the ritual needs to be performed, I do not need to seek his permission. He told me he accepts my judgment. If I think it needs to be done, then to do it. He did say, here's my cell phone number, text me, and I will, <laughs> and I will pray for you while this is going on. <laughs> so the riot will begin with uh, sprinkling of holy water on the person. 
which is a reminder of our baptism, of our new life in Christ, that we have become a new creation. So once again, all these rituals reinforce the basic tenets of our faith, which the, de the devil and the other demons have rejected. So new life in Christ, represented by the holy water. The litany of the saints, by which the mercy of God is invoked upon the troubled person. So those who are in the glory of heaven, if you will, are called to come and be present. Uh, the recitation of one or several of the psalms that implore the protection of God and extol the victory of Christ over the evil one. Psalm 91 is a great example of calling upon God's protection. And then the gospel is proclaimed as a sign of the presence of Christ. We know that at Mass, why do we stand when the gospel is read? Because they're the words of Jesus himself. So gospel accounts of Jesus casting out the demons. So the demon is reminded that it has been defeated already. So why is it persisting? And then the exorcist has the imposition of hands. So laying hands on the head of the person. Breathing upon them. So calling upon the Holy Spirit. Because wherever the Holy Spirit is truly present, an evil spirit cannot remain. And then there is the... The Apostles' Creed is recited, or the person is uh, made to renew their baptismal promises. The Lord's Prayer is recited, by which God our Father is implored to set us free from the evil one. And then the person is then showed a crucifix, which is the source of every blessing and grace. And the sign of the cross is made over the person, by which Christ's power over the devil is shown. Because we know that in the cross... The devil thought he finally won. But what he thought was his moment of victory was actually his moment of defeat. And so the cross is shown to remind the devil, you have been defeated. Mm -hmm. So why do you persist? And then uh, a supplicating exorcism prayer is then said. Remember what I said at the beginning, a supplicating exorcism, God is addressed. So this is, a exact, this is an actual supplicating exorcism that comes out of the ritual itself. O God, creator and defender of the human race, look with favor upon this your servant, whom you formed in your own image and called to share in your glory. The ancient enemy is attacking him fiercely, crushing him with violent force, tormenting him with wild terror. Send upon him your Holy Spirit to strengthen him in this battle, to teach him to pray in tribulation, and to shield and protect him with your mighty power. And then after the supplicating exorcism, God is directed, the imperative exorcism is then performed, by which the demon is addressed and commanded to depart. And these prayers are always said in a very authoritative voice. They can be repeated over and over again. You know, these, when these rituals are begun, the manifestation of evil will begin. And they're meant to call forth the demon to show itself because only when it reveals itself can it be uh, defeated. So I charge you, Satan, enemy of human salvation, acknowledge the justice and the goodness of God the Father, who by his righteous judgment has damned your pride and envy. Depart from this servant of God, whom the Lord has made to his own image and likeness, adorned with his gifts, and adopted as a son or daughter of his mercy. I charge you, Satan, prince of this world, acknowledge the power and the strength of Jesus Christ, who defeated you in the desert, overcame you in the garden, despoiled you on the cross, and rising from the tomb, transferred your spoils into the kingdom of light. Depart from this creature, who Christ, by his birth, made his brother or sister, and by his death purchased with his own blood. Depart, therefore, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Depart through the faith and power of the church. Depart through the sign of the Holy Cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Repeat it over and over again. My experience in using these prayers is when the demon is being tormented very severely. It's when the manifestations will become very violent. Because the devil does not want to depart, but it knows that it cannot resist the power and the authority of God, and eventually it will give in. When the demon is cast out, then prayers of thanksgiving and a blessing are offered. An example of a prayer of thanksgiving, O God, creator and savior of all human flesh, 
who in mercy have rescued your beloved servant. Safeguard him by your providence and keep him in the freedom your son has given to him. Grant, O Lord, that the spirit of iniquity may no longer have power over him. At your command, let the goodness and peace of the Holy Spirit enter him so that he may fear nothing from the evil one. Because the Lord Jesus is with us always, who lives and reigns with you forever and ever. Amen. These prayers, him or her, my experience is, people always say, oftentimes stories you share are a lot about women. I always say, not more women are possessed than men. <laughs> but women are more apt to ask for help. Oh. So, men figure they can deal with it on their own. So the final comment, and then if you have any questions, so what's the best defense against the forces of evil? We turn to Philippians. And what does Philippians say? Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So if we focus on the, the positive aspects of our Christian faith, then we have nothing to fear whatsoever. So hopefully you're not going to go out of here and be afraid, but you're going to go out of here with a renewed commitment to your faith in Jesus Christ. Because it is that relationship that will protect you from the reality of evil. A question? Yes? Um, so, with the lady, did she know that she was possessed? Like, do typically people know that they're possessed and come to you? Or it's more people who see it? It's a combination of both. Sometimes people know, and sometimes they're brought... Like, in her case, was she aware that she had demons within her? Or was she was aware of it, yes. And she, she was told she me trying that whenever the demonic manifestations would begin, she was, like, trapped in her own body. Mm. So she was aware of what was going on, but she had no longer power over her body. Now, so people, here's a good question. Why would the devil or any evil spirit be interested in possessing a human body? We get old, our hair falls out, you know. <laughs> So what's so great about the human body? And the answer lies in the greatest thing that God has done for us, which is in the incarnation. God took on human flesh in the person of Jesus. So the devil in his own twisted sense, who wishes to take the place of God, you could say that he believes that he has his own version of the incarnation when he possesses the human body. Um, this might be a stupid question, like Hollywood, whatever. But like, you talk about like superhuman strength sometimes. like. Have you ever had to like, restrain someone to, or have you ever been like, hurt physically? I have not been hurt physically because other exorcists, we, we tell stories and they tell me how they've been hurt or injured, and so I learned from that. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the exorcist in San Jose, California, Father Gary Thomas, he's made the, the movie uh, The Right and the Book based on him. He told me when he was doing his first exorcism, when the demonic manifested, he got punched in the face. <laughs> so, which is why the supplicating exorcism prayer is important, because you're asking God to protect and safeguard everyone in the room. So you don't ever, I mean, like, so do you, like, what precautions do you take to prevent that from happening? Prayer. Just that? They're not tied down. they got superhuman strength. What if he's a rope gun? <laughs> <laughs> I think the power of God is greater than a, than a, I don't know, handcuffs or anything else that you might do. Alright, so I know that the devil can play on our imagination, so when you have dreams that like cause sleep paralysis, or, because obviously like we have nightmares, but some of them like you can tell like, a diff like I know I've had dreams where like it's caused sleep paralysis, or you just wake up and you feel different, or like you can't get out of it, like how do you explain that, and how do you like, not freak out. <laughs> you just pray at that moment. I know, but like, because I, I know personally, I and mean, I think like other people have told me things they've had. Like, I just don't understand. Like, is sleep paralysis is that something of the devil, or is that like of just our mind, or how, is it like is there any way to know? Like, I guess I, I would know something about the history. <laughs> Are people intrigued by things of the occult or watching lots of these crazy movies? Because you get these images and things in your mind, mm -hmm. and then. Well, the devil will choose to play on all that to kind of terrify us. Which is why it's important the images that we put into our minds. Um, can I just go back to that real quick? Um, 
I've had similar experiences, and sometimes there are images that like haven't seen because yeah. I don't really watch that many scary movies. Do you think that's a sign of like that's not just a bad dream? That's like actually something to pray against. I think so. Okay. Because even in if you look in biblical accounts, oftentimes God revealed things to us through dreams. So you know, an angel came to Joseph in a dream and said, "Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, or don't be afraid to take." You know, the father's mother into your home. So it could be that God also lets us know what we need. Um, I like her question because uh, I was going to ask. She asked if it can physically harm you while it's being exercised. What about after it's been exercised? Because I've had experiences with that. After the after exorcism, the spirit is still tormenting. Or? <coughs> or, no. So. I was a youth, at, or a youth leader at, at a camp, mm -hmm. and on the last day we were singing worship, and one girl went into what we thought was a seizure, but it ended up being demonic, and we prayed for, I believe, like an hour, and finally we heard four distinct howls in the area. Mm -hmm. While we were driving back, it was me, four of the leaders in a suburban, and we heard one of the howls, and we looked to see where it came from when something hit the side of the car and flipped us off the road. Um, and the reason I was asking is because when it hit the car, it hit where I was sitting, and it pinned the door in my leg um, between the seat. So I had to go through the fifth to see that my knee fixed up. You could have ticked off the evil just by what you were doing. It was looking to retaliate. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that could happen. That would be an example of vexation where people are experiencing physical attacks. That's why, as I said earlier, the Catholic Church doesn't have a monopoly on practice of exorcism, but the Church does say that anyone who's going to engage in the practice really needs to know what they're getting into because you can put yourself up against the forces of evil. Because even before I would perform an exorcism, I would prepare myself. You know, the Scripture talks about the importance of prayer and fasting, that the priest would celebrate Mass, put a reconciliation, so to make myself spiritually strong before going into battle against evil. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, is that prayer of supplication that you said, is that something that like even we as lay like, people could use? Yeah, um, there's, a, there's a whole series of prayers that and people then, can pray for themselves. Um, so say that I guess there's like a demon that is kind of... Um, can, can a demon, I guess, like manifest itself like from one person in a family, I guess, to like another person who's not like present in the location? So what happened, my little brother, um, I, he fell into, I think, habitual sin, um, is what we believe what it was, and he wasn't able to speak, and my dad prayed over him, so I guess it was a prayer of supplication, and I had no idea any of this was going on, I was here in San Marcos, and that night I had a... Um, extremely vivid and disturbing dream, and I called my mom the next day just to tell her about it because that's the kind of relationship I have with my mom. And um, she was able to tell me that she had a similar disturbing dream, and um, so it was like the demon was, at, or what I assumed to be, was like trying to mess with our family, and so I guess like going into like trying to break our family. Um, and our break, like trying to break our relationships between one another, and so it was just like crazy though because it was, you know, I'm like hundreds of miles away from them, and, and uh, it was a very strong tie, I guess. In that. Well, there, once again, demons are not bound by yeah. time and space as we know it, um, and so then, they move like this. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, and then, do you act in like persona Christi when you do the? Exorcism? Imperative exorcism and stuff? No. No? That's why when a priest celebrates the sacraments or mass of the church, he acts in persona Christi. But exorcism is a sacramental of the church. Okay. So the devil knows very clearly who's in yeah. front of him. Okay, wow. Which is why the exorcist needs to be in the state of grace. Um, like, what's the, uh, I don't know how graphic can you get, but like, have you ever seen, like, I mean, is it true, like, what Hollywood says, like, where they bend back and, and stuff like that, and if they do get into a, a weird position, does that affect them afterwards? 
They can talk about, like mentioned, bodily contortions. So I've seen people when they manifest evil, they, their body will try to twist. I've seen people's jaws drop down and move off to the side, uh, change in appearance and complexion. I saw somebody levitate. See, I think by a lot of these times, the demon is playing on our minds and imagination. Because I have to admit, did a person really levitate? Or was the presence of evil playing on my mind? So that's what I think I saw. Because you'll hear people talk about when there was a case of exorcism in northern Indiana where they said that this boy that was possessed crawled up the wall like a bug. Now, did he really do that? Or is that what the people believe they saw? And then is that, like when that happens, is that when, you all, when the exorcist says, because um, you said that you said reveal yourself, that's how you can. Yeah, but those that would only be done within the context when an exorcism is actually taking place. Because if you're visiting somebody for the first time and manifestation begins, that would not be the time or the place to begin the ritual because then you're doing it on the devil's terms rather than on God's terms. So, yes? Um, I guess I have two questions. The first one, uh, holy water, sacrifices. Well, we should never treat it as a lucky charm or a talisman because it should always point to something greater. If the water is a means in and of itself, it means absolutely nothing. But if the water is being used to remind us of our new life in Christ and baptism, that's a positive thing. Let me give you an example. I had a young man call me from Illinois one last year and he said, my girlfriend's possessed and I did what I was supposed to do to get rid of it but it didn't work. <laughs> so I'm always, I was like, really? What were you supposed to do? He goes, well, I went down to the local store and I bought some sage. And I've been burning sage in the house because I understand the demons don't like the smell of sage. And I'm like, are you listening to yourself? <laughs> so he was putting his faith in sage. Sage wasn't going to save him at all. See, that's, you know, sacramentals of the church can be good, but sometimes people mistreat them. Somebody told me one time I was driving in a car with somebody and they had the little guardian angel clip, you know, you put on your visor, and they go, oh, this is going to protect us while we're driving. I said, that piece of metal is going to do nothing for you. <laughs> now, if that reminds you that Jesus said that his angels in heaven are watching over you, that's a positive thing. But if you're thinking that's going to help you, you just ought to hope it doesn't get stuck in your chest when you're driving. <laughs> That would be bad. Oh. <laughs> and then, do you have any further insight, maybe, as to where the demons would go after the fact, if they didn't go on to commit others? Well, we know that God has permitted them to roam this earth mm -hmm. until the end of time, when the final judgment takes place. So they don't really, well, we're back to that, where do they go? They don't really go anywhere. The, the exorcism prevents them from acting in a place or a location. So we only say that they're here or there if they're choosing to act there. And so the, the ritual of exorcism would command them to no longer act, either on a person or in a place. <laughs> yes? Uh, like, in like the first session, you gave us the people were cursed, and you uh, came down, you told them that what they needed to do was to uh, get closer to God and reconcile the relationship with God. When you tell people that, are people a lot of times like not satisfied with that answer? Oh, they like, are very unsatisfied. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be like, it's gone, like everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you're, like, no, like, you have to like continuously like start to like, seek God. Now see, I always say that when I tell people to do what I think is very ordinary to pray and grow, grow, grow closer to God, they look at me like I'm nuts. But if I were to tell them, what you need to do is to go swing a dead cat around your head <laughs> and go out at midnight of the next full moon and howl at the moon and swing the cat. <laughs> they would look at me and go, where do I get the cat? <laughs> so people are going to want to do the most bizarre and odd thing. <laughs> or they might say, will a raccoon do? But I saw one on the road. <laughs> yes. Yes. Say it out loud, kind of? Or like, okay, so there was a movie, 
There's a movie where they said um, one demon's name, it was like some crazy Hollywood movie about exorcisms, and that demon's name got stuck in my head. It's a real demon's name. And like every time I was in the shower, I was like repeating it in my head. Like, I was like, am I calling him right now? The answer is no, you weren't. I wasn't because he couldn't hear me? That's right. Okay, so. <laughs> People are moving away from you right now. <laughs> Just don't say it out loud. Okay, okay. <laughs> Unless of your free will, you allow them to know you. <laughs> don't they participate in God's um, universal knowledge? Like that's how saints are able to hear our prayers as well. They, they don't, of their own accord, hear our thoughts, but they, by by union with God through their participation okay. with Him, are able to hear it because they're on His side. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just curious: the Eucharist, which is which has a true presence of Jesus Christ and puts our own soul in union with God, why can't it be as easy as just placing the communion inside the person? Because they have to believe. Without belief, then. We're treating the Eucharist even as some type of good luck charm. Okay. So one needs to have faith and believe. That goes back to the, the age of reason again. So you want people to know what it is they're receiving. You know, people have that debate all the time, like Catholics, there's not open communion in Catholic churches. It's not that we're being exclusive, but as Catholics, we believe that the Eucharist is so central to our identity that people who receive communion should believe what we believe. Because as Catholics, corporate belief is important. So when we come to Mass on Sunday, we're not a collection of individuals who are believe whatever we want. There are things that we hold in common, which is why we recite the creed. So the church says if you're going to receive communion, then you need to be in union with what we believe. Because it's not just a matter of what you believe individually, but when you receive communion at church, you're also saying that you believe what the church believes, teaches, and professes to be revealed by God. But does not the demon infested inside of you believe that that is Jesus Christ himself? But if the person has no faith, and once again to the degree, because I've known people that either they're experiencing uh, vexation or obsession, they still receive communion. It's just, they're just in that state of being tormented. Okay, I have another one of those questions. But I've just been kind of trying to sit here and think about what parts of the Hollywood dramatization are real and what are not, and a lot of what you're saying is real, I didn't think was. So along like the line of that, is it true that animals can sense like supernatural spirits and things like that? You see that a lot in films. Is that true? So there are some people that believe that. That's even based kind of in human history. What you know, why were arrows <coughs> buried yeah. in cats? Mm -hmm. The sense was that cats could sense the presence of evil and ward it off. I was wondering what the church... Um, the church doesn't really have a whole lot of... It's like if, if you look in the Catechism of the Catholic Church about what the church teaches about the reality of evil and uh, all that, it's very limited. The church says that it's real, but it's still this whole mysterious world of which we just have a very small glimpse. But we don't need to be fixated on the <coughs> invisible world. We need to live in this world the way that God intended us to live, and if we do that, we really have nothing to fear. Because even when we recite the Creed on Sunday, what do we say? We believe in uh, God the Father in the visible and invisible. So we say that we believe there is an invisible reality. Yes? Um, okay, well, you know, is it possible, like, back to the whole, as you know, like, in the whole to be able to see demons, not necessarily having practically a cold, but I guess, uh, I, want, I want to say born with the gift of it. So, is it possible to have the gift of, of seeing demons or evil spirits? Yeah. Without being possessed? The quite, well, God would have to allow that to happen. So, is it a gift that comes from God, and then it's possible. When people claim to have gifts, I always, I always want to hear them say, but God has given me this gift. When people tell me they have a gift and somehow it's just for them or whatever, then I get a little leery about that. I know a woman um, who she said that, I don't remember if it was 
like visions of the future, or if it was just like, but she said that um, like by the grace of God, she could like communicate with the saints and like they could you know like help her help other people and like I don't want to say like Catholic fortune teller, but that's what was kind of described to me. But she. But none of that. But not, that, I guess those things are all possible. But none of them are essential yeah. to our faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In response to the animal things, could it be that uh, the spirits find it easier to uh, affect the animals or, since they have uh, since they can't affect the people directly because of their faith? They would affect the animals around them to create a doubt. So you could use, I guess, the if your faith is good, the animals around you would react before you would tell anything. Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, do you have any experience uh, or have been taught anything about generational sin opening people up to the possibility of evil, presence of evil? Could you talk about that? So the topic of generational curse has always come up. Because in the book of Exodus, it says that the sins of the father can be passed down to the third and fourth generation. But in the book of the prophet Ezekiel, I think it's chapter 28, verse 12, somewhere around there, it says that that's no longer the case, that each person is now responsible for their own. It is possible, I think, not for the actual sin to be transferred down through the generation, but the effects of the sin. So if you think for, if somebody is an alcoholic, for example, and you grow up in that home, you're going to be impacted by that growing up, and it may shape your adulthood life. So I don't believe that the sins of others are passed down anymore. But I believe the effects of them can be passed down if people are not really living out a committed faith life, if you will. So that's one of those issues that you're going to get varying answers on. Because there's a lot of people involved in deliverance ministry that are caught up in the belief of generational curses and having people fill out the family tree and cleansing all of that and whatnot. But I'm not a proponent of that. I think the effects... Because otherwise, we believe that the grace of baptism means nothing. So somehow, baptism wasn't enough to cleanse us of generational curses. But the curse is actually more powerful than the new life in Christ. So I think there's a lot of poor theology that's at play there that really needs to be looked into. But it's become a very common practice, and lots of times people just accept that as a basic a basis of faith, but it's not really a basic thing. It never has been. Who hasn't asked the question okay, yet? Here. How long is it an exorcism usually take, like, whenever you start the exorcism? I don't, I don't ever go more than 30 minutes. Well, no, like, like a process. I know you said... It depends on the, uh, the degree of the presence of evil. How long was your long <laughs> That woman I worked with for one year. Okay. Now, raises a good question. Why is it that exorcisms have to be repeated? Jesus did them once and they were effective. It does seem that exorcisms performed in the pagan world, in which the good news of Jesus Christ has never been proclaimed, and then when a person is possessed, hears that good news for the first time, the demons depart immediately and the, the exorcism is effective. But in the apostate world, it seems to be different. So people who knew the good news of Jesus Christ and then became indifferent towards it or rejected it and then became possessed, then the evil seems to have a greater claim on that person. Because they knew the good news and then they said, no thank you. Over here. What you said earlier, um, when we were talking about intergenerational curses, have you seen... Um, or legacies, or however you want to refer to them, have you seen the effect of mental illness that's passed down yes. as, as, as one of those manifestations? Is that true? Yes. Yeah, mental illness, I have seen that. You know, the whole thing with mental illness can be a very difficult one, because in working with mental health experts that I've worked with, the question is always, is it strictly something of a mental nature? Is it strictly evil? or is there a combination of both at play? Mm -hmm. For example, did somebody encounter a presence of evil in their life and the mind fractured as a way to try to compensate for this presence of evil? Or was there a mental illness that the evil began to 
play upon and amplify, if you will, in this person's life. The only example I share is that the former exorcist of Indianapolis used to go to Central State Mental Hospital right across the street from his parish. And he said when he would go to take communion to some of the residents, and whenever he would go in the front door, the residents around the door would curse at him and spit at him when he came in. And he would go and, and take communion, and when he would leave, these same people, have a good day, Father, thanks for stopping by. But he believed that it was the demonic reacting to the presence of the Eucharist on the person. So they were reacting to that. And when he no longer had it, they weren't acting adversely to that. So. But have you seen mental illness as, maybe as a um, passed on in generations? Some examples of that. But I really rely, because I mean, I don't have the training in mental health, so I rely on experts in that field to weigh in and help me understand and share their knowledge with me. Father, hey, mm -hmm. over here. Yes. Um, can you perform an exorcism on somebody who doesn't want one? No. You cannot perform an exorcism on a person against their will because we all have free will. Someone could make the choice for evil, even though I would think that would be a bad choice. <laughs> People are still free to make it. I worked with an elderly man, went to see him one time, and he wasn't of any particular faith, and uh, his family was concerned because he was ill, they thought he was going to die, and they told me that this man had really associated with the demonic his entire life. So when I went to visit him, he said, he's like, well, Father, I know my family is concerned about me, but I've really befriended demons throughout my life, and it's really the devil and these demons that I wish to spend eternity with. So he goes, I know my family would want otherwise for me, but this is the choice that I'm making freely. I had a, a young man, there's a, the Knights of Columbus operate a, boys school in Indiana near Terre Haute called Javalt School for Boys and there was a young man there named Kyle who was in for assaulting a police officer and Kyle told me that after he had dedicated his life to Satan and called Satan his father that he found such a strength in his life that he would he became so addicted to it that he could never let it go. I, another, <coughs> another young man in Indianapolis, a uh, Hispanic man that I went to visit because his brother had called me because he was concerned about his brother, but this young man, uh, it sounds bizarre, but his bedroom was broken glass. His entire, there was nothing in his room, no carpeting, no furniture. His floor was covered in broken glass, and there was an altar to Satan in the corner. And this guy would go in there and lay on the glass and offer prayers to Satan. So there's all kinds of bizarre things that people do but they have free will to choose to do that. Yes? You said that if we have strong faith, the devil runs, and we have nothing to fear. But if situations occur, like the gentleman and the lady described out there, does that mean our faith isn't strong enough? Or it might be God's way of letting us know that. I mean, we're constantly we, we're needing to take our faith to a deeper level. In Catholics, we always say that conversion is an ongoing experience. So each and every day, we grow stronger in our faith, and that could be a call just to to grow more deeply in holiness. So how do you recognize demonic oppression and recognize that okay, this is a gift from God versus this is something that should be taken care of? That comes after meeting with somebody and listening and kind of discerning what's going on. Because people that are experience oppression can be extremely holy. Like they go to daily mass and things like that. That they're being tormented. It's not, it's, I have it, somebody that's in the hallway had a question. Oh, so she texted, in the hallway? Well, she has a lead, but she had like two questions she was like begging to ask. One of them. This is the first time I've ever gotten them on email, by the way. Texas <laughs> <laughs> State, way to go. She, her first question was if a woman is pregnant while possessed, um, will the child like be born, I guess, with like the demons or something like that? Which I don't know, like. Baptism would like cleanse them of that, but like that was her first question. And the no. second, okay, so but no. remember the child was under the age of reason. Right, okay, I'll tell her that. And the second one was Are all the demons the, the same seven demons that you were talking about earlier? Like anytime you're possessed, is it going to be one of those seven? No, because there's myriads and myriads of them, so. Okay, thank you. Father.
Yes. If they're not baptized, you said that you sprinkle them with holy water before you start the exorcism, but if they're not baptized, do you baptize them or like do you just remind them? <laughs> yeah, they could that could be a part of the process when they're asked to either uh, make a profession of faith with the Apostles' Creed or instead of renewing baptismal promises to make baptismal promises. And are there any books or like websites that we can read up more on without That's always there's a lot of bad books out there. Right. There's a lot of good books, so sometimes you try to weed through all that. I keep a bibliography of, of books that I recommend. So yeah, you can ask one of the missionaries, and you can send me an email, and I'll send you a bibliography. Okay. Wait, over here in the corner. Yes. Um, so if someone has, um, like in terms of gifts of the Holy Spirit, um, there are two that I had questions about. Um, the gift of prophecy, um, how does that align with what you said about like no one can see the future except for God? Um, if one has a gift of prophecy, then yeah. the gift is of God. It's not okay, of that so person. It's, okay, it's because of their relationship with God. It's the same way in the, living, the okay. angels of living in God's okay. reality, if you will. Okay, beautiful. Um, and then my second question was, if someone has been given the gift of discernment of spirits, um, what... Uh, what is the function of that, um, and like, how can they practice that safely? So if one has, a or like, what is unsafe to do? Um, I have a friend who. Uh, if one talking. believes they have the gift of discernment of spirits, yeah. I would say that they should have a spiritual director. He he does, yeah. And that that would be the person that they would always go and check things out with. Okay, so are they if they like are confronted with a person who's like troubled? Is it okay for them to be like? This is what I've discerned in you. Is that safe or is that not? I think, it, see, I would want to hear, this is what God wants me to yeah. say to you or reveal to you. Okay. Not, this is what I see. That that kind of language makes me uncomfortable. Okay. But it's, if someone says, God has placed on my heart to yeah. reveal this to yeah. you, okay. that's a different matter, I think. Okay. So if things are through Christ, it's safe. Yeah, and I think that's why if one has a spiritual director, then they can always, yeah. they're constantly checking that. Uh, sorry, I don't want to make a comment, but like, what's the worst scenario you've been? The worst here? scenario that I've been in? Or like the, the worst encounter that you had? If, if this woman that I work with, the, with the Europe, with the seven demons. Because there were some days I was just like, is this ever going to end? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the first time I met her, I... I I was asked to uh, see her by um, another priest, and I went down to visit her, and you know, we visited, and I didn't see any manifestations of evil, and then at the end, I said, well, I need to leave now, but let's pray, and when I started to pray, she lunged at me like a wild dog, and I have to tell you that I jumped back, I think, five feet without my feet hitting the ground, <laughs> just a, a reaction like, what? I mean, she literally was like, Wah! just like that, and I was like, whoo! <laughs> I think my heart was going like this, and, I, and I'm continuing to pray, and I'm like, <laughs> I was just not prepared for that. Did you still stick to only, like, you could never go more than 30 minutes with each time you saw that woman? Yes, 30 minutes only. Because I, because I think sometimes the longer you go, then the devil can just play with you the whole time or whatnot. Is that a personal decision? Yes. Yeah. And that's based on the priest that I trained with in Rome. He would never go longer than 30 minutes. And I asked him why. He just said, you take what you learn about that evil spirit, and then you use it against it. But at some point, you just reach mental exhaustion, fatigue, and then you're just going through the motions. And yeah. in a certain sense, the evil, will, the evil one can outlast you. If you're not mentally strong, you somehow you're losing focus on what you need to be about. Yes. Okay, so in Deuteronomy it says not to conjure up the dead. How can we reconcile that with asking for the saints' intercessions? So the reconcil reconciling the dead? Well, because the saints are not dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it's the same thing. You're asking, you're asking for their help, and you don't have to do it verbally because they participate in the beatific vision. So... 
you are asking, it's, it's kind of like me asking you, hey dude, you want to pray for me? You're asking people who have been perfected in their relationship with God and are not dead to say, hey, can you all pray for me too? That's, that's basically I thought you were going to raise another question that I sometimes asked, which is when people claim that there is a spirit in a house or a house is haunted, what is there? Is it really the spirit of one who's, de- who's died or is it an evil spirit? Because the spirit of one who dies cannot choose to continue to act in a location of its own volition. If a spirit of one who has died is acting in a location, then God himself must be allowing that to happen for a particular reason known only to God. But I can tell you that 99% of the time, when people are claiming that there's a ghost in the house, it's actually an evil spirit that's toying with these people. You watch these crazy shows on TV and these people are out ghost hunting and then it's like at the end of the show, well, hey, we're going home now, but whatever you are, don't follow me home. <laughs> it's like, what is that? <laughs> but, but then we see in the scriptures, I think it was King Saul who uh, conjured up Samuel's spirit. Yeah, the witch of Endor. But even the witch of Endor was surprised because she didn't do that of her own volition. It was actually God who did that to teach a lesson. Because even the witch of Endor was like, was startled when the spirit of Samuel appeared. But Saul was wrong to conjure that spirit, even though it was a, he was he living? Was wrong because it was a violation of the law from the book of Deuteronomy that he would have been very familiar with. So then God allowed that to happen as a teaching moment for Saul. Okay. It's always a question of, who is the one who is orchestrating these events? Is God the one behind it, or is it the evil one behind it? But let me tell this story real, real quick. The exorcist in New York City who advises Cardinal Dolan told me one time he was called upon by a religious group of sisters. They were, they were selling their convent because they were relocating, numbers were down, and they told him that they needed his help. And he goes, what help do you need? He goes, they told him that their convent was haunted and they wanted him to take care of the spirit. And he goes, well, how long has this been going on? And they said, 100 years. This has been a part of the convent that it's been haunted. And they're like, it's kind of our friend, but now that we're moving, we don't want to leave it behind. So he did an investigation, and it was determined that it was actually the spirit of a nun who had died 100 years previously. And... Once again, God must have been allowing this spirit to manifest to some degree. You know, and the only reason that God would allow that is because perhaps the person needs prayers. And so this community never bothered to pray for this person. <laughs> but strange things would happen in the convent. Things would move and clamor and whatnot. And so he said that what they did, he goes, for four weeks we're going to celebrate a memorial mass for this nun. And he said the first week they were celebrating mass, they got to the the Lord's Prayer and they said, deliver us from evil. And he said the lights went out in the chapel and the lights on the altar blew out. He said the next week they were celebrating mass, same thing, deliver us from evil, the lights went out, candles blew out. Third week, deliver us from evil, candles blew out, the lights went out. He said on the fourth week they were celebrating Mass, they got to the Lord's Prayer, and they said, deliver us from evil. The lights went out in the chapel, the candles blew out. A moment later the candles relit on their own, and the lights came back on. All the presence of that spirit ended. And he said he believed that the spirit gave the sign that it finally had received what it needed to move on to wherever it needed to be. So... So, so one can choose to believe or not believe that, but that's the story he shares. So is that spirit in purgatory? Or? Yeah, in that process of purgation. So there, yeah. Uh, maybe, it's just, maybe it's just my house, but uh, my mom is, is extremely paranoid and would never let me watch like those ghost, or ghost shows or like uh, things of that nature because she said like, I don't know, maybe someone somewhere along the line she was told that it invited those types of spirits into your life. You know, and I think not just watching them will invite them in, but if that stuff starts to play on your imagination and whatnot. Oh, okay. That could be the, when I talk about literature, oftentimes people ask about books like Harry Potter. Now, I don't think if you read Harry Potter that somehow you're opening the doorway to evil. It can create a fascination with magic practices and whatnot. But if, if children are reading these books 
and parents then sit down and talk with them about what they're reading and how that you know, relates to our faith, it can become a teaching moment, if you will. But sometimes that teaching moment is lost. And then perhaps young people develop a not so good fascination yes. with evil. Hey, Father, over in the corner. She's had her hand up for a long time. Yes. Yep. <laughs> It's, a, it's after 11 o'clock back in Indiana, so I'm getting bug eyed, but that's all right. Go ahead. Um, okay, so earlier you were mentioning the different doors you can open um, to let in evil, and one of them was communicating with spirits. And I always thought of those like, well, obviously, don't communicate with spirits, you know, um, the typical. But what about like deceased relatives? Because a lot of people will be like, oh, if they're, if they're deceased now, you can like talk to them, but just like in a prayer way. Is that the same as communicating with the spirit and thus opening a door because we don't actually know if they're in heaven or hell? I think you could offer prayers. I mean, that's the notion of November is the month of remembrance, the end of all saints day, and then all souls day, and kind of we remember our dead. The question is, if it, is it a healthy approach to the dead or an unhealthy approach? You know, if you're talking to the dead, hey, can you show some sign that you're here by rattling the table and things like that? <laughs> That would seem to be unhealthy, but just the notion of commanding them to die and whatnot. Yes? Yeah, uh, you mentioned this uh, age of reason, uh -huh. where you know, God takes care of you and stuff like that. Um, but uh, it's weird because isn't it that like, children are more successful with spirits most of the time? But not of their own volition. So they're not the one to bring you up by themselves. They can't, no. Um, what would you advise, like, an entire family of, like, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents that have experienced demonic activity all throughout, just because of the brokenness and, like, alcohol abuse, um, emotional abuse, all those things, divorce, what would you advise them if, one, they're not Catholic, and two, they have tried to pray these things away over the years and they just continue to happen? What would you advise? They, they pray so they want these things to go away. So I guess I would ask, why aren't they going away if that's what they really want? Right. Is somebody really holding on to something? Because mm. I think the inability to forgive. I mean, every family is dysfunctional. Right. <laughs> but to me, you can become a functional, dysfunctional family when you realize you're dysfunctional. Right. You, you, know, you take ownership of your baggage. And that's the notion of going to confession is that you place these sins in the hands of God, and once they're in the hands of God, you can begin to uh, to grow from that. But my guess is if if these people are praying and whatnot, then somebody really is not very sincere in the desire to heal the brokenness. Because sometimes there's always somebody that feels I'm I'm justified to feel the way that I do. Yes. Uh, I was curious can you tell me the difference between evil spirits and just a regular like spirit in purgatory like you were talking earlier? So, uh, like now, ninety percent of the time it's like demons. Because like, like, I think the, the spirits of those like in purgatory are always seeking prayers. That's all they need, and the demonic would not be seeking that whatsoever. So I would really look for something of a spiritual nature. Is it safe to say that if you believe in you know either just God or the Trinity, um, whatever any? anything to do with eternity, that by watching scary movies of demonic, um, you know, like beasts, anything that's, uh, that brings about fear, um, that if you believe that by watching those movies would be kind of an act of either glorifying the devil, like, not intentionally, um, or displeasing to God, you know, like, when I, when I see other people go to scary movies, I think, you know, if I were to go, would God be pleased with this action? Um, so, being a believer, um, would it be safe to say that God isn't pleased when we wa even watch this movie, not inviting anything in or not um, worshiping, but spending our time? Oh, I would agree with that. I would yeah. agree, yes. Okay. She wants to know if I encountered the same demon on two different occasions. No, I have not. Is there one last question? Right there, okay. Um, the Church of Satan's based in Hollywood. Old Testament 
in the journey of Daniel, in one of the apographer books, the angel that goes with him on the journey that he doesn't know is an angel to the end of the journey, burns liver from a fish, which he says scares demons away, and prayer and fast.